Welcome all to uh, this fun-packed session which is about working across uh, boundaries. Um, the structure, he says hopefully. Moving on. Just need to click on the slide itself. Perfect. Here we go. Yes, so uh, here's, the, here's the format. So there's four of us involved. Um, Benjamin, who's here, um, Nikki and uh, Fern, who will be uh, joining us over the internet. Um, the structure of the session is you will hear four um, short presentations with various perspectives on interdisciplinary working. Um, some sort of methodological theoretical points of view and some case studies. Um, then we will go out into breakout sessions. There are three face-to-face -face, uh, sessions which are all out of this room, so you'll all need to leave and you'll be directed to the right place, and two online ones. And then we'll have, um, there's a facilitator who will feed back some key points um, when we all come back uh, into this room. Um, if you, if it's okay, if you could, um, if you've got questions about the presentations, save them for the breakout sessions, questions and comments there. If you feel that they're not adequately addressed, we'll do them back in the plenary, but just to keep the pace up, because we've um, put a quart into a pint pot, to be honest. So, um, yeah. So, uh, rather than me going on any further, um, hopefully, Nikki, I can see you there, um, and I can drive the slides for you if you like. I think Nikki's asked if. Oh, I've heard Sorry. Yep. If I stop. There. Can I share my can I share my screen? Yes, should be able to. Great. Can you see that okay? Great. Um, well, good afternoon everyone. It's a shame also not to be with you in person. Um, and uh, but very exciting to be at the start of this programme. So I'm Nikki Beaumont, and I am, uh, by training a mix of environmental economics and marine biology, and I lead the Sea and Society team at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. We're a team of social scientists embedded within the laboratory, which is predominantly, predominantly natural scientists. We've been there for 25 years now, so they're quite used to us. In fact, they're quite heavily reliant upon us now. So I think of us as very much a success story about how to work in this interdisciplinary way. I want to run through a really quick why, what, and how of interdisciplinary endeavor today. So the first slide on why do we work in this way is actually very similar to Patrick's. I think that no one can deny the fact that we are in unprecedented times, be that due to climate and net zero, be that due to pollution issues, be that due to flooding and coastal erosion, be that due to pandemics. I think the, the amount of change that we're seeing is just phenomenal. And if we're going to tackle these, these issues, I, it's absolutely critical that we use transformative interdisciplinary approaches. It's a very straightforward why. What is a little bit more complicated? And we see these different words around interdisciplinarity used a lot. Um, I, it, it, we see cross-disciplinary and um, interdisciplinary, and they're used in this really mixed up, muddly way. They're actually very different, and I just want to take a minute to explain to you why. If we start with interdisciplinary, this is just obviously a single discipline operating on its own. And I am a bit of a food junkie, so I'm going to use some examples of food to try and get these clear in your mind. The example for interdisciplinary, I will use as an, just an apple, just one straightforward thing. For cross-disciplinary, um, those of you from the 70s, I'm using an example of pineapple and cheese. And this is because disciplinary working is where we have the different disciplines involved in a program or a project, but they don't really have a lot to do with each other. They might talk to each other at monthly meetings, but there's a chance that their outputs might feed into one another, but they don't really influence each other's working. So like the pineapple and cheese, it's, it's better for being together, but not a huge amount of influence. Coming around again, we've got multidisciplinarity, and now you can see the disciplines are coming closer together. And an example of this may be if you're working as a social scientist and you produce some survey data, your environmental modelers might use some of that survey data to input into their environmental models and make a little bit of a difference to the outcomes. And in us right up to date here, I've Use the example of carrots and hummus for this, because this is where we start to really intermingle. 
um, with a little bit more seriousness. Then interdisciplinarity um, is where the disciplines are really starting to influence each other in a more detailed and in-depth way. So if we think back to that example of the social science survey data feeding into the environmental model, in this case, the data might be used by the environmental modeler and make them think about how his model works. And he might change some parameters or some of the concepts actually within his model as a result of that social science data which they have received. And um, example here I use is a coleslaw because you can still see those individual disciplines. You can still make them out, but they're very much intermingled now, very much mixed up. And the final bit is transdisciplinarity. And this is where the disciplines are so closely embedded, it becomes quite hard to separate them. You, you start to not really be able to see the difference between them very well. And the example here is a chocolate cake. So you know within this cake that we have got flour and sugar and butter, but you can't see these different components anymore. You, you, you created something very new and very different. And in fact, you get to the point here where you can even be creating a new individual discipline as a result of the, the disciplines coming together so in such an in-depth way. Now, the reason for being clear on this um, is because, well, for one, I think it's incredibly important we get our terminology correct. But the other is to be really sure when you're starting a project where you want to be on this spectrum. If you're starting a project thinking it's going to be transdisciplinary and everyone's going to be really working closely, but other people on that project have got this sort of cross-disciplinary idea in their minds, you're going to really struggle to get where you want to be. So understanding where on the spectrum you want to be, communicating that more broadly to the people you're working with can be incredibly helpful and empowering early on. I think a very important point to note is that there's no good or right place to be on this spectrum. It's not like the further around you go, the better you're getting. There's value in all of these different individual places to be. Um, and I think that is also really important to keep in mind. So I want to run very speedily through seven, interdiscipl seven principles of interdisciplinary working. So we talk a lot about barriers and challenges and i quite solution focused and like to think about how we're going to do this. And the first how I want to share with you is uh, by respecting each other. And I want you just to think for a moment, if you've ever looked at somebody else's job or their discipline and thought, mm, that's really hard, that's harder than what I do. So think if you felt like that. And then think if you've ever done the same and actually looked at someone else's job or someone else's discipline and thought, oh, that, that's quite easy. I think I could actually do that. It's quite a lot easier than what I do. Now, the issue is if you fall, if you said yes to either of those, um, I know that I have, is fundamentally you're, you're disrespecting that other activity because you have no idea. We have no idea what it's like uh, to be acting in a different role, in a different discipline. And as soon as you fall into that trap, that, that lack of respect leads us to, you know, really stumble on our interdisciplinary working relationships. And I've got top tips for these. I'm just going to pull out a couple. Um, so one thing that's really great I found is to do an activity together early on, so write a publication or a plan together, um, and make sure that your project guidelines are co-developed. So Access is doing brilliantly on this already, I feel. The second thing is to take time. So interdisciplinary working takes a really long time. Every meeting takes twice as long as you'd expect because you spend a lot of time communicating to each other about what it is you're actually doing. And budgeting this in, building this in, being honest about the fact that a one hour meeting is probably going to take two hours is, is absolutely key. The third is communication. Everybody here, I'm sure, has come across a situation where you're trying to communicate your discipline to somebody and getting absolutely nowhere. Um, you speak different languages. So I've got a host of top tips on this. My favourite top tip here is exemplified by the picture. And I took my interdisciplinary team down to uh, the field site, in this case it was a salt marsh, and we stood there and we all said what we could see. So the economists said what they could see, we had an NRW where they said what they could see, and the ecologists said what they could see. We all talked about our, our visual experience. Um, it was brilliant. It was absolutely fantastic. It was a really good way to sort of start us being able to communicate well together. The fourth um, uh, principle is to embrace personalities. I think we often think of each other as like, you know, I'm working with an economist or I'm, I'm working with an artist. 
and actually you're working with a human being and it's really easy to sort of forget that and so getting to know each other is, is, is really important um, and the other thing is to remember that no one person embodies an entire discipline so if you had a bad experience with a physicist it doesn't mean that all physicists are bad <laughs> keeping that in mind just keep looking there might be one out there for you um, fifth is to prepare to make sure that you're well organized and that roles and responsibilities are very clearly aligned early on um, and um, things like having a agreed publication strategy are really really helpful sixth is adaptability so this is the fact that when we work in an interdisciplinary way things generally don't go how we expect because there's just too many variables and actually i think um, that when things go a different direction than you're expecting on your project that's a sign of success so actually that's a good thing because you've learned from each other and you've shifted what you're doing so i i, I think that that is important to keep in mind be ready to adapt and actually see it as a positive and my seventh and final one is to share. So share and learn. So we tend to not always talk about our interdisciplinary experiences. There's a lot of literature out there on this, um, but actually talking to each other about what works and what doesn't, I think is really very important. So that's my what, my why, my why, my what, and my how. Um, and you can look the details of this up um, on the, uh, report that we wrote for the Valley Nature Programme. And at this point, I will stop sharing and I'm coming back. Thank you very much, Nikki. I have to say you've made me hungry after seeing your different seven types of uh, interdisciplinarity, especially for cheese, but uh, thank you. Um, I'm Benjamin Silvacool. It's nice to meet you all. And I'm going to pick up the presentation, I think, right here. There we go. Um, it's really nice to be here, especially because I don't think I know most people in the room, which is not usual because uh, I'm at the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex where we've got like 120 different social scientists, but mostly from geography, history, innovation studies, science technology studies. So it's quite neat to be learning from other scientists in forestry and marine science um, and even environmental psychology and sociology. Um, my presentation is more uh, a kind of interesting benchmarking uh, that I wanted to share, mostly because this works again. Um, about 10 years ago, we did a very extensive content analysis to kind of explore how much interdisciplinarity is going on and how much are the social sciences valued in the broader domain of energy and climate research. And that study was really depressing because the answer was not much. Um, and I just wanted to spend a few minutes going through its results, and then with new results we just collected and published last week, which paint a very different picture. So the first study from 10 years ago was based on content analysis of published research. So already you can get a sense for biases, right? We're not looking at rejected articles. We're not looking at grants or PhD theses. Uh, and we only narrowed it to three different energy journals. So again, a very small sample. One is a kind of political science and public policy journal called Energy Policy. Anybody here published in Energy Policy? Hurrah! Patrick Devine Wright has published probably 20 times uh, in the journal. Then you have the Electricity Journal in pink. Anyone published in that? Uh, it's Law and Regulation, so a different type of energy journal. And then finally we have, with a very presumptuous name, THE Energy <laughs> Journal. As you can probably guess, that's an economics journal. Um, anyone published in the Energy Journal? I have not, by the way. So we took three journals that weren't even technical. We're not talking applied energy, right, or science or nature. We're talking three journals, public policy, regulation and law, economics as a big term, behavioral economics, applied economics. So we were expecting to see a fair number of social science articles. Again, I told you we did this 10 years ago, but we did look at um, 4,444 articles, and this is before machine learning, so we had someone read them all. Uh, and we also cataloged 90,000 references. And again, we didn't have machine learning, so someone had to actually put it into an Excel sheet. Um, and basically, you can see here that even though we chose those three social science journals, uh, the social sciences were less than 20% of the affiliations. So already a kind of, what? <laughs> what is going on? And you can also see a huge bias towards North America and Europe, even though these are global journals. right? You can see here, like, four-fifths come from Europe or 
North America, 49.6%, even though energy policy is hosted here in the UK and the Energy Journal is hosted in Canada. You can also see, uh, obviously, very few transdisciplinary collaborations, lots of affiliations in hot pink, <laughs> which are universities, which makes sense because they are academic journals. Um, you can also see a very strong dominance of men. There were some years that some journals, like the Energy Journal, had zero female authors, not one for that year. Although I have to be open with you that the method was indeterminate in about 10% of cases. If it's R.A. Smith, we couldn't tell if it was Rachel Smith or Ronald Smith. So it, there's air brackets there that we couldn't identify any female authors, but there very well could have been some female authors. Uh, most articles did not disclose funding, which may or may not mean that they're you know, not really cutting edge because they're not based on actual projects and data. Um, and relevant here, look at the number that just did quantitative stuff. Uh, only 12.6% used what I would call human centers methods, and I found this very alarming. Look at purple. A third of the articles had no method at all. So they're kind of like opinion pieces with some references. And I laugh at that. My third highest article is one of those. <laughs> because we do, right? We write, the, oh, I have some opinions, and there's some evidence to support it. And there we go. Um, finally, you can see here, we're just getting into whether they were doing comparative work or whether they were doing multi-country work or looking at kind of intergovernmental work, and it is fairly rare. Um, and then we looked at citations, and again, look at how low social science is, 4.2% of what they cite. And look at the arts and humanities, 0.08%, right, are classified as like Scopus, ISI, arts and humanities journals. So what we drew from this was to argue 10 years ago, well, we need a lot more human-centered methods. There are very few uh, participatory or transdisciplinary methods. It was about 19% of articles were actually deeply interdisciplinary. So that's like chemistry with social science, arts and humanities with physics. Um, you can also see the dominance, as I mentioned already, of just uh, non-social science disciplines, non-social science bodies of evidence. And we then went forward 10 years ago and said there are 12 hopeful thematic topics we thought should be explored more, gender, equity, justice. And those have been explored more, I'm quite pleased to say. So that's where we were a decade ago. And now I have the good news and partly what motivated me to do access. And so what we did this time is a poor PhD student of mine called Abbas Abdul Raifoul, who's about to do his Viva, by the way. So if any of you really like what you're about to see, we're looking for an external examiner, maybe contact me over coffee. Abbas started with a process that looked at more than 100,000 sources of evidence for projects. So now we're not talking articles, we're talking grants. And then he did a, a, a narrow sample of 1,000. 1,000 actual projects in the last 30 years. And we cataloged all of this up to 2020 and published it basically this year, submitted it last year. And you can see I'm starting to circle in red already some very promising kind of social science themes like climate information or socially managing climate risks, which are very popular in adaptation, or energy efficiency and behavior is the number one topic in energy which is good. I'm sure Nick Ayer at CREDS, which is the Center for Energy Demand Solutions, is probably ecstatic over this. Um, same with transport. We see the rise of things like ride sharing, carpooling, transport behavior. But then we also have the methods these, these grants used. And again, with these thousand projects, our data was a questionnaire sent to all PIs. So this isn't like our speculation. This is data reported from the PIs where they told us on a questionnaire all of the disciplines that they used, all of the methods that they used. So it's very reliable. And you can see far, far better quantitative models, right, which were like 60% 10 years ago, are 5%. Qualitative research, 20%. Literature reviews, 16 Experimental designs, about 10%. And it gets even better when you talk about where people come from. Social sciences, arts, and humanities dominate the sample if you add them together.
Now again, this is a thousand projects, not representative, right? There could be sampling biases. It could also be when they saw our invitation, social scientists felt they had to respond and the physicists were like, I'm not wasting my time on this. Um, so there, and we acknowledge that. There's kind of little way around that. Um, but I'm blown away that you know, look, even if it's just social sciences versus engineering and technology, that it's like one percentage point away in terms of what is actually being funded. And by the way, this is not based on number of projects. This is based on budget. So it's not like there were a thousand social science projects with that had $10 million and there were 10 physics projects with that $100 million. Uh, and you can see that it is all updated to US dollars in 2020. Finally, and I'm almost done since I know I'm out of time, we then asked these PIs if they considered their work transdisciplinary. And we used almost the same definition that Nikki had up there about transdisciplinarity is working with non-academic practitioners, et cetera, et cetera. Our PIs are telling us that 74% say that their projects were transdisciplinary. Now, this could be moral licensing. They all want to say they are, even if they aren't. But if you take it at face value, self-reported, right, they are claiming to be transdisciplinary. So maybe that does mean that we're now at a new paradigm for research, one that has a lot more respect for the arts and humanities and social sciences. One, if you go back to here, that sees incredibly diverse methods working together across a pretty even pizza slice of different disciplinary approaches. Even those like the life sciences, which we wouldn't expect to see a lot, we're there at more than 10%. So maybe it is a new frontier for how we're beginning to do energy and climate research. And with that, I'll pass it back to Pete. Thank you. So can you yeah. yeah. Sorry, I know you said no questions, but just to clarify, I missed the timing on the first piece of research, so I'm just wondering whether what changed was the research method or, the, yeah. or genuinely the transdisciplinarity of the work. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. You can see too that the first piece, it goes even back to the late 90s when we're collecting data. So there could be incongruence in method. However, for the, th the thousand projects, they could have started in 1990. So it was 1990 to 2020. So at least the time frame is a bit overlapping. Maybe it is a difference between a project <laughs> versus a published paper. Um, but I still, I was surprised. <laughs> and in one of the articles, we have a table at the start that talks about recent findings about interdisciplinarity, and most of them are, are not what we find. They're still arguing for dogmatism, exclusion of social sciences, right? We have to put people at the heart of climate action. That's Patrick's argument. Um, content analyses of the IPCC report, which are like marginalizing the social sciences. So I think, um, yeah, our findings, for whatever reason, do seem to kind of not be conventional. Thank you, though. Great. Um, yeah, I'm on. Very good. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, I'm going to continue with some of these um, issues. Um, <coughs> I, I'm going to be optimistic as well about this trend. Um, so, yeah, let's get to it. So, um, I am Peter Bailey, and I uh, work in the Environment Agency on Social Science, and we're involved with access with the other great British nature and environment agencies. Um, we, we run a network which we've allied to this one. Um, I'm not going to do this slide. I'd love to do this slide. So this is all the epistemological, ontological stuff that we all love, but it is important. And ju just to say, what I'm going to focus on here is... Um, so this is all about, not about w just what, but for who. And so I I'm going to concentrate on this policy audience, instrumental knowledge for the policy audience, but I do appreciate that um, there are other audiences um, out there, and even for access, definitely. So, for example, this public one. Um, I'd strongly recommend that uh, uh, Burroway's paper, if you're not familiar with it, from 2006. OK, so uh, you can have somebody from the Environment Agency without talking about flooding. So, um, here we go. So. Flooding, uh, I've been in environment for about 20 years and involved with the social science team for that time. And flooding has definitely moved in our understanding and our policies and strategies to what you could call a socio-technical system now of flood management. And uh, I've got a picture which demonstrates that in many ways. So there we've got Bewley on River Severn and the demountable defences there. And as you can see, that needs people 
to put the defences up and down, so it's just not a standard hard engineering embankment. And also um, we give out flood warnings and we want people to do stuff behind those defences as well. So um, out there in practice, society matters as well as engineering and that's also in our research programmes. I've got a couple of examples of work that we've done. Um, one here is some mapping of community resilience um, using um, an existing model from um, Susan Cutter in America. So we've mapped community resilience uh, in England at that spatial scale. So that's Kings, uh, uh, Hull, Kingston. And um, that um, tool that we produced relied on um, not only ONS socioeconomic data sets but also um, our hydrological modelling risk mapping and also where we have flood warning areas so it, 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 it is a multidisciplinary endeavour in the environment agency and the other one there is an example of some inequalities analysis that we've done um, which also needs the flood risk assessments to do that analysis um, so lots of positive work there um, in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of the strategies and policies, although I would characteristic probably more as a multidisciplinary endeavour still. Um, so there's a flooding example. And then um, the bank managed to get involved in emergencies um, like flooding, and I was seconded into um, Go Science Sage um, in the first year of COVID and uh, I think there's some very interesting parallels here that I just wanted to uh, raise um, and also bring out some of the politics of knowledge here. So um, you might remember this first graph. So this is the epidemiological model and you might remember the squashed sombrero. I don't know if you do. Boris Johnson's metaphor at the time. So that this, this here is the peak of the epidemiology. So epidemiology is medical statistics. There's a model of the infections at the start of COVID. And then the intervention there is basically people doing stuff. Yeah, so that, that, is, that needs some understanding of people changing their activities to change the transmission. And the epidemiological modellers had to make some assumptions of how society works and interacts. And then over the course of the first year and the second year, they, those assumptions started to be informed by behavioural and social scientists as well um, to validate, and data, to validate some of those assumptions of how we, um, of, of the modelling, basically. And then you will remember um, SAGE became quite uh, well known. And as you can see here, there were hundreds of papers um, produced. And there, were, there was a subgroup that I was part of the Secretariat for on um, behavioural science. And so that's, for example, one of the papers. And um, the real point I wanted to make here is um, why did that stuff um, find its way into the official science and into policy making and uh, to a large extent that came from uh, Chris Whitty unfortunately the mug is uh, obscured there, it should say the man, the myth, the legend um, behind that mug um, so um, Chris Whitty for, he was involved in Eb Ebola and the Ebola outbreak they realised that they needed anthropological input into how to manage Ebola because of burial practices in Africa. So he was already sold on the importance of social science for pandemics and Patrick Valance also went along that journey and um, still champions the use of behavioural and social science. So I think um, you, you can have all sorts of issues about the policies for COVID and how it's managed, but in terms of the evidence produced through the official evidence structures, there was definitely uh, inclusion and even integration in the epidemiological models of social and behavioural science. And then this last one here, if you see the little podium he's on, the, the messaging, do you remember? So one of the main customers for this evidence was the comms teams. The messaging was... A, not as a um, psychologist, say, would want it early on, I suspect you could argue. So, but here we've got a much simpler messaging, uh, hands, face, space, so action orientated, but like we have with our flood warnings. And, um, you know, that was in part informed by um, social science and behavioural science insights about the messaging for COVID. So I think that there's uh, definitely trends in my organisation on using this and there's um, other examples. And um, what I'm excited about Axis is um, 
we've got the opportunity to do this, do more of it, and I think net zero is, is a perfect example. I was going to start to put together the slide, and I realised there wasn't much to put on this slide. So um, I look forward to working with you so that we can actually, in, in the government space this is, yeah. so there's lots of great work that you all know in, in the academic space and IPCC, but I think to a greater extent it's not found its way into government. Um, so I think that's one of the opportunities that this network will offer. Okay, Fern. Fantastic. Should I share screen so I can? It's fine by me. Okay. Right. I need a second. There we go. Can everyone see that slide? Great. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so. I'm an example of what happens if you go too far around the uh, cycle towards transdisciplinary from uh, Nikki's presentation, in that I don't really know what discipline I actually am anymore. Um, I run the Institute for STEM in, uh, STEM in Culture and Society at uh, the University of Birmingham, and I lead a range of different projects across a range of different disciplines and adopt a different range of um, approaches. So I'm a transdisciplinary researcher who does cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research gets very confusing but just to give you an example of how um, sort of complicated that can sometimes get these are just some of the um, larger grants I'm currently leading on at the moment um, one is the KRI Future Flight Challenge which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment because it's quite novel technologies and obviously people may not be aware of this um, but I'm working with um, the Innovate UK and the SRC to develop um, a social science research strategy um, moving um, towards not only the end of the challenge, but as we move into the scale up and industrialization of advanced air mobility uh, programs. I'm also co-leading the Birmingham Plastics Network um, with a colleague colleague of mine who is a material, well, a polymers um, chemist. Um, I'm not going to pretend to describe the chemistry. I wasn't great at chemistry at school. He's far better at it than me. Um, but um, that is really um, looking at finding more socially informed ways to think about sustainable, sustainable plastics futures. So thinking about um, not just the environmental context of plastics, but the social purposes, roles, usages, and ways in which plastics can impact on different communities. So um, that's working across social sciences, business, environmental sciences, and chemistry. Also, one of the things that we're looking at there is where there might be opportunities to develop new materials. So actually looking at advanced um, uh, advancing chem chemistry research as well. And then one of the other programs that I lead, um, which is a rather large scale one globally, is the Science Religion Exploring the Spectrum program of work, which is really looking at science communication across diverse and pluralistic societies, particularly looking at attitudes towards things like um, evolutionary science and other hot topic issues that where there's a perception of conflict between um, different cultural identities and science acceptance. Now, this one's an interesting one because actually we're um, a multidisciplinary team who work across different facets of the social sciences, so sociology, um, social psychology, but also working with history and media studies um, colleagues from the humanities side. So we've got teams in eight countries, Argentina, Australia, Germany, Spain, Canada, Sri Lanka, US and UK. I'm sure I'll probably miss one. And we have a network of um, researchers in 28 countries worldwide. So just to quickly touch on the uh, future flight works, I recognise that we're running over slightly. Um, this is um, really looking at three types of new technologies that are being developed. So drones, um, as we like to say, not the twiddly ones you might see in the park, but payload carrying drones that can carry payloads of three to four tonnes, which is obviously a, a scale up of drone usage uh, that we haven't necessarily seen before. Um, advanced air mobility, so you might have heard of these referred to as flying taxis or flying cars. Um, it's electrical vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, so in a way really more like an electric helicopter. And then regional air mobility, which is looking at hydrogen and electric powered flight to be used for regional connectivity in the UK and obviously globally. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting with Future Flight Challenge is that this isn't just working with other colleagues um, within the academy. Um, it's working with colleagues in industry and in policy. So it's very much at the sort of um, technological end of the work that we do. Um, and I think one of the huge opportunities here for us is really to sort of move from an approach that is um, 
characterized as technological solutionism. We design technologies to go and solve um, social problems. And really flipping that around because we're so, so far upstream with these technologies. They're in development. They're being uh, t tested and designed as we speak. There's still a chance to change the trajectory of the ways in which these technologies are developed through a socially informed lens. And obviously they are also part of a broader program of decarbonisation as well. So I think that really speaks to some of the um, concerns and issues that Patrick has raised as well. So I just wanted to leave you with a few quick reflections from across that rather sort of um, complex set of different disciplinary approaches that we adopt in our work. Um, one of the things I wanted to reflect on a little bit is why we sometimes refer to our work as multidisciplinary, not interdisciplinary. We do do a number of different projects that can be cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary, but I tend to build my teams around multidisciplinary strands of research. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, it's very easy when you're looking outside of the social science in to see us all as a homogenous mass, but actually we're a, a morass of people who've got different cultures and norms and traditions within our different disciplines and actually sometimes some of the most difficult intersections can be between um, social science disciplines for example sociology and psychology um, whereas we embed those approaches in our work um, and this is because there's sort of there's there's theoretical and um, commitments that are made within those disciplines that sometimes can be seen at sort of cross purpose and they come back to sort of bigger picture issues like nature nurture for example is it behavioral or is it socially constructed and these aren't debates that are going to go away so i think the most important thing to recognize is we can't always combine our methods we can't always necessarily um walk the same path but we must do it respectfully as Nikki says and I think one of the things to do is always act with intellectual humility recognizing that sometimes and this is the philosopher in me because I, I did originally study philosophy and so um, we can't always be certain in the way that we're, we're sort of assuming things and I, I think that that's one of the core things about working across disciplines in, in any of the sort of models that we've discussed you've got to respect the sort of foundational norms within each other's disciplines Another advantage for multidisciplinary research is that it allows us to triangulate our findings. Um, it allows us to work at different levels within societies, so individual groups, communities, and social and cultural narratives. Um, but it means that our teams can engage with specialist audiences, and this is quite important when we're thinking about supporting early or mid-career researchers, because obviously they need to publish in specialist journals in order to tick the boxes to get the permanent posts that they all uh, need and deserve. Um, so there's a number of ways that we sort of build that core multidisciplinary work, but then we build across the top of that interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches. One of the other things I wanted to reflect on is obviously we do this work not just in the UK, but we do it globally. Um, and by globally, we mean both working with partners in Global North and Global South. Um, and I think what's really important is we have to understand that not only are there those cultural differences within the social sciences, when you take the social sciences sort of global, there are cultural differences within different types of social sciences in different cultural contexts. So you need to recognise that there's sort of diversity within, say, sociology. It's very different in terms of approaches that are adopted and seen as the sort of, you know, the most um, respected and validated norms within the UK are very, very different to the US one being more qualitative focused and one being more quantitatively focused. And that can cause some issues in terms of conversational language across sociologists. So we need to recognise that we're not always speaking the same language or adhering to the same cultural norms within um, disciplines, subdisciplines or fields even. So that's, I think, a really important thing to reflect on if you're thinking about doing global, uh, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary research. The other thing I just wanted to reflect on is that um, we are hugely lucky to be able to be working embedded with Innovate UK as part of the Future Flight Challenge team. It gives us that opportunity to work so far upstream uh, with technological development that we're not working, as Patrick indicated earlier, often um, uh, social sciences is seen as that bolt on that comes on at the end or the public engagement piece of work. We're actually working to drive a socially informed model of development, which is it, it, it doesn't often happen, so we, we're incredibly privileged to be able to do that. But I think one of the things that's really important to remember when you're working that far upstream is that the social science is nascent too. We're not just talking about an emergent field of study within technolo the technology side, we're talking about an entirely emergent field of study within the social sciences side as well. So we are engaged in field development. 
um, which means we are creating entirely new ways of working within the social sciences in order to engage with people who are working with entirely new forms of technology. Um, so sometimes we have to recognise that we're all learning together. Um, and that there needs to be a bit of work going on behind the scenes to sort of build those those fields and sort of boundaries of those fields as well. So it's sort of this, all I'm sort of finishing with really is that it's, as I'd like to say, it's always much more complicated than that. But the thing I would sign off with is just recognising and respecting those complexities and working with intellectual community is the key to successful projects in my view. So thank you. Um, I told you we were trying to cram a lot into this session. Um, so we have a choice, and maybe Patrick might have a view on this. We could either have a discussion in plenary now um, of this, or we've got, we have time to do 20-minute breakouts and come back for a 5-10 minute discussion. So um, how about we vote? Who would like to do a plenary? Right, we're doing a breakout. It's good. OK, that's good. This is Exeter calling. Could we have the results of the jury... Okay, who would like to feed back first? Is it Fern or Nikki? Is it Nikki? Fern? I can feed back or Nikki can feed back. <laughs> I have a million notes. Um, so I, I will keep this brief, but we had an incredibly rich and very, very, very um, valuable conversation. Um, and um, I think the, the sort of key thing we sort of focused on was really it's, it's, it's the internal cultures that we construct within the academy that are the sort of primary, primary um, barriers to the ways that we're sort of talking about working. And this isn't just about sort of, um, uh, sort of different you know, approaches, it's sort of creating an us and them. And perhaps we should reorientate the way that we think about research to focus on the questions, not the disciplinary identities. Then we also had a sort of conversation a bit more about how we construct those questions, because obviously talking across disciplines can help us think about the ways in which we are framing and articulating research questions in the first instance. So imagining this utopian future where we can have uh, cross-discipline conversations to design questions that then lead to programmes of research, um, which are then informed by the social sciences. We did reflect a little bit on some of the... Um, the barriers to um, sort of progression within um, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary careers. We've got to reflect and remember that, especially for people who are at sort of early career and mid career stages, that there can be huge obstacles to working in this way in terms of promotion, publications, funding, and even teaching. Um, because we have constructed these very hide bound disciplinary cultures within our organisations. And we have uh, to remember that so those disciplines. Fern, thanks. I think we just need to. Um keep the pace up so everybody gets to go thank you uh, Patrick are you um, are you still able to talk oh it's disappeared okay would you like to go next Brigitte oh sorry I just presume yeah, yeah. We were in group three. Um, we had very similar issues. We talked about challenges um, facing researchers. Uh, one was um, uh, we teach in disciplines. Uh, and there, there are not many cross-disciplinary modules or, or programs. Um, we also discussed that research councils still somewhat work in disciplines, although there was recognition there's lots more cross-disciplinary research being funded. Um, uh, and um, ESRC people were commenting that actually it's challenging to find an assessment panel that has the broad range of, of uh, disciplinary uh, backgrounds on it that you might need to assess things in an interdisciplinary manner. Um, we also discussed um, the need to focus on the problems themselves, as the other group did, rather than, uh, you know, interdisciplinary working is not the goal. The goal is solving the problem that you're all working towards. So, yeah, much uh, discussion of that. Um, in the civil service, um, they seem very good at kind of recognising the skill sets around them and championing one another's uh, a contribution to solving the problem uh, and early career researchers in the room felt that um, academia was less good at that, at recognising the skills around uh, th that their colleagues have elsewhere in the, the university. So those were the, the key themes. Perfect, really interesting. Uh, Benjamin, were you going to uh, for your group? We have a nice esteemed moderator, Chris mm. Jones. Mm. Uh, I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a microphone on, I don't know if it's working. Oh wow. 
can, hopefully you can hear me already. Uh, so we spent most of our time introducing ourselves to each other, uh, which was quite nice. Um, I mean, what that did do is show that we had a very diverse group. Uh, and what was also quite interesting is that a lot of people, whilst naming themselves as belonging to a particular discipline, also evidenced that they'd moved to different departments or started classifying themselves as being part of a different discipline throughout their career. So we're quite a nomadic group of people, and I think that that does present opportunity, but it also does present some challenge in terms of um, applying for funding, for example. We did note that, that JES can be quite rigid at times in terms of sort of asking us to, to state that we are part of a discipline and then stopping us from applying for things because we're part of that discipline. We were assured by our ESRC colleagues that JES is, is loosening up somewhat. Um, one thing was mentioned which is quite interesting is that, that sometimes we're our own worst enemies as social scientists and that we have a lot of infighting and that maybe we should learn to get on a bit better. Um, what can access do? Well, it can probably help us to get on a little bit better. Um, we can certainly raise some of the different issues that we're facing from different perspectives. We can draw upon our combined experience in order to know better how to publish in interdisciplinary journals, apply for interdisciplinary funding, etc., etc., etc. Uh, so we had some really good conversations there. We did finally suggest that we do need to perhaps have greater presence communication uh, from the research councils at these kinds of events, because we do have ESRC here, which is great because they're funding it, but it'd also be nice to have maybe more active presence of some of the other research councils, although I believe some are online just now. But that kind of conversation at the, the research funder level uh, would be good. Uh, and also, finally, just uh, we do perhaps need to abandon our disciplinary labels that we tend to use quite readily in favour of doing more problem-oriented uh, work. And I'll end there. Great. So, uh, as a sociologist, I don't know. Um, so, um, this is the last shout out for the on the Zoom group. Um, oh, Patrick, you've popped up. Are you going to feedback? Sorry, yeah, I maybe got the timings wrong there. But yeah, we had a, an interesting discussion. I've made some notes. Um, I think uh, Richard started off really by asking the question about the the structure um, that provides opportunities for interdisciplinary work and how how that's set up and, and what the receptiveness of, of interdisciplinarity might be. Um, so, and, and some of that is about speed, um, which maybe picks up on some of the uh, access work program about responsive social science and how quickly can we mobilize social science if, for example, technology, is, technology development or policy development is happening very, very fast. And Fern's example, obviously, is a good one where uh, the social science is being built in, even if it's emergent at that early stage. So whoever was involved in that, that sounds like an, an interesting choice to make, but it doesn't always happen, obviously. Um, we, we, we did talk about the training a little bit, and uh, Claire commented that um, often the interdisciplinary side of education vision is relatively poor. So that's something we could look at in terms of well, what works well, uh, what models out there that are a bit more successful. Um, and we were, we were aware of the way in which definitions and discourses like behavioral science, social science, and uh, behavioral change, those things press different buttons in different contexts. And sometimes there are opportunities, sometimes they close down things because of sensitivities around the politics of behavioral change, et cetera. So we discussed that too. And I think um, Harry made a, a, what I thought was a really good point, which is a kind of a novelty bias in academia or social science, where we're quite prone to reinventing wheels because we're searching for a new framework or a new concept, and actually this has all been thought through before. So I think there's a lesson there um, about how we do that. And, and Melissa talked about the structure of interdisciplinarity and how putting together, putting people together in problem-facing institutes or, or teams is a useful way forward to try and shed some of the... Uh, maybe some of the breaks of the inertia around specific disciplines. So there's a few thoughts, and I'm happy to share the rest of it in their form. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. And just the last group that I, I was involved in. Um, so at, at the end, we uh, there was quite a strong call that actually we kind of know how to do this, and we should just get on and do it for the challenges that matter, um, which I think we all uh, kind of agreed with, but. Um, obviously, that will need some enabling possibilities about how to do it. Some things that struck me, um, Neil um, pointed out that, it, that often you can do this once you're established, say, mid-career. Um, you, you can take some risks um, and uh, move beyond the core of your discipline, whatever that core might be, if it really exists. Um, so that was an interesting um, 
point. And then we also had the other, other discussions about um, other times through people's career, what they might need. We had some, a few people in the room who who do do trans, are in transdisciplinary centres or um, work in agencies where um, we just need to get on and do some of this on the ground. And we had discussions about how to, how to uh, train uh, staff in that professional delivery context um, so that they're open to um, social science and transdisciplinary working. Um, and in terms of the Research Council funding, uh, the EPSRC a Responsible Innovation Process was held up as um, potentially a model which has partly solved this um, early on. So um, we thought that um, there were some good examples in the Research Councils to build upon. And uh, that, sorry we stole your break, but that gets us back on time. Sorry, I don't know what's happening next, so... <laughs>